Um, so a little bit about myself. And you'll see in front of you a picture here. This is a picture of um, a book. Um, I serve here doing trauma counseling, um, cross-cultural trauma counseling and recovery with two different NGOs. Uh, one serves refugees uh, um, from a recent refugee crisis, uh, which you guys are probably familiar with. And the other one is an organization for uh, outreach and support to uh, affected by human trafficking and prostitution. So, from my office here in Athens, I can walk to about 200 uh, brothels on foot. Uh, and this is one of them in this picture in front. You might see, like, towards the bottom of the screen, the white. Can you guys see that? Um, that's what a brothel looks like in Athens. And I say illegal because um, prostitution, although it, prostitution is legal in Greece, Almost all of the hundreds of brothels operating in the city are not meeting the government's requirements, which means underage people, people working for papers, uh, women being held against their will, women not having access to health care, this type of thing. So um, there's a lot going on in the field of trauma in um, Athens and actually around the world. But I'm excited to talk to you guys because. Um, vulnerable people groups intersect with healthcare providers all the time. Um, I read a statistic recently that the 74 percent of human trafficking victims um, see a healthcare provider within the first two weeks of being trafficked. So, I mean, let that sink in for a minute. That means that there's a lot of things involved in trafficking that would cause a person to. Um, to be in a doctor's office, to be in an emergency room, to be in a clinic, and intersect with healthcare providers. So it's so important for you guys to think forward to understand vulnerable people groups and how to interact with them. So I'm excited to share a little bit about that with you guys from my experience. Um, so vulnerability, we're talking about uh, what makes people vulnerable, what puts people at risk, and how you guys can recognize those populations as they come, as you come into contact with them in the place where you're, um, your healthcare environment. Um, something that's helpful for me is think of vulnerability on a, a scale. Okay, so at one end you have safety and stability. Right? This is where we want any patient, any client, or any person that we're interacting with, this is our goal, right, is to help people to be um, safe and to have stability. Um, and at the other end, we can think of uh, exploitation as being the opposite extreme. This is the extreme at which people's vulnerability, their risk factors, are actually um, not just disadvantaging them, but they are causing them to be exploited, taken advantage of, or gain uh, by others. So all the, the space in between safety and exploitation is vulnerability. Um, and as healthcare providers, we're going to meet lots of different people along that scale, right? You're going to meet people at all different points. And something that really helps me um, in working with vulnerable people groups is to think, I just want to make sure that whatever time I intersect with that person, whether it's one session, whether it's weeks, whether it's months, you want to always be concerned that everything you're doing as a healthcare provider is moving people towards safety and stability, and away from exploitation. Does that make sense to everybody? Um, that's just a helpful way to think about it, especially when, when we think about vulnerable people groups can be very fixated on developing the savior mentality. I'm going to save this person. i got to get them out of their situation. I've got to fix their problems. Um, and we know that that's not really helpful, realistic. So um, a great way to think about it is what can you do with the skills that you have and the environment that you're in, with the amount of time and resources that you have to work with, what can you do to be moving people along the scale towards safety and stability and really walking or pouring them to walk towards safety and stability, because that's what we want um, for people. So I just want to go through really quickly. I'm going to save time at the end for questions. Um, but I want to just go through this material. These are some of the factors 
um, impacting people at risk. Some things that you are very obvious, some of them you may not have thought of before. Um, gender. This is something that we, um, this is often a hot topic, maybe in our very um, sort of uh, empowered Western world, um, gender is not as big a factor as it is around the world, but gender is actually a huge risk factor. There are, there are lots of situations in which women are vulnerable to exploitation and at risk just because of their gender. Um, and this is just something that we need to acknowledge even in our own country, this is a, a risk factor. Uh, this is a really helpful quote. Um, from a great book, Half the Sky, which is more about the situation of women worldwide, the global situation for women worldwide. So reading this quote, um, Nicholas Kristof says, it appears that more girls have been killed in the last 50 years precisely because they were girls than men were killed in all the wars of the 20th century. More girls are killed in this routine gender side in any one decade than people would have slaughtered all of the genocides of the 20th century. So let that sink in. What we're talking about here is selective abortions, um, female infanticide, um, bride killings, uh, uh, um, all of those things that you can think of add up actually something that um, some sociologists call like a, like a femicide. An actual, you know, attempt to exterminate people simply because they are female. So this is a real risk factor, and we need to have this in our mind. Um, and and we'll see we'll see why that has more implications as we go on. Um, so another quote from this book, which is a great research, I encourage you to read it if you can. Uh, women aged 15 through 44 are more likely to be maimed or die from male violence and from cancer, malaria, traffic accidents, and war with them. So um, let that sink in a little bit. Gender in itself for many women around the world and many women who you might intersect with in a healthcare setting is actually a risk factor. So moving on, poverty. This is one we think of a lot, right? Uh, poverty puts people at risk. Um, for exploitation, certainly, but that's it will be vulnerable. Um, there's the obvious, the economic poverty, right? Um, people are desperate to get out of the situation when they're def desperate to improve their situation when they don't have opportunity. Um, that that's something that puts them at risk. A, a type of information, I mean, a type of poverty that we don't talk about a lot is information poverty. Um, we see that a lot with the refugee crisis. The people don't have safe and um, credible sources of information, right? So they're not able to make the decisions, the empowering decisions that we want people to make in order to move towards stability because they don't speak the language, because they can't read or write, because it's not available to them, um, or in many cases because um, they're, they're getting, they're, some kind of crisis or chaos that is causing information to be interrupted. Um, displacement is a huge factor uh, that puts people at risk. Whenever someone is displaced from their home country, their home language, um, even on a smaller scale, just from their their own environment, when someone is not in their their home environment, that puts them at risk. It certainly puts them at risk for exploitation. Um, of course, that can be voluntary. If someone um, is leaving to try to better their situation, and it can be involuntary. I mean, involuntary. If there's if there's war or violence or um, a population exchange or some kind of uh, displacement, where people have no choice but to flee. So those are all. These are all factors that put people at risk. Um, documentation. This is something that we don't think of a lot because we have a very, um, you know, as much as we, uh, there's a lot of debate around immigration and things like that, we have a process that can be known and understood and participated in, in the U.S. when it comes to documentation. And many, many countries around the world do not have that. So what I mean by that is um, they can't get clear answers about their documentation. They can't get help. Um, getting the proper documents. Um, for me, 
in my context here, a lot of times we have women who, um, for example, a human trafficking victim status is really important. If you have status as a human trafficking victim in the EU, you have a right to certain services, you have a right to um, types of protection and um, certain employment opportunities and things like that. Um, but one of the requirements of qualifying to be as a victim of human trafficking and having that status in the EU is that you have to agree to testify in court against your trafficker. So for a lot of women, um, they're not able to get this status because of threats against themselves or their families, or, uh, people back home. Um, they're terrified uh, to testify or against the person that brought them. So status is a huge, um, or document, these types of documentation are, are huge when it comes to people's risk factors or what might um, cause them to be exploited. Uh, of course, all that has to do with rights and access to services. Um, in many countries around the world, if you don't have the proper documents, you don't have access to health care. You don't have um, a right to an attorney. There's all. We kind of take some of those things for granted in the U.S., but around the world, those things are a real struggle. And those are the kind of things that can happen in the U.S. too. Um, another huge risk factor uh, is family and community systems. Uh, we know that there are people in, um, in these types of systems that are at risk because they are part of a community in which um, um, yeah, in which they are vulnerable. Discrimination is a huge, huge one. And we know that this happens all across America and certainly across the world, that there are communities in which discrimination is used to keep people vulnerable and to um, exploit people who are vulnerable. Um, and that's something we have to be aware of, right, as people come through the door of the context where we're providing health care. Um, hold on, I'm having trouble. Slide to turn. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. I'm not sure what that's going back. discrimination is one. Um, there are also cultural systems. I mean, I see that in context. Um, there are cultural systems that keep people, that, that put people at risk. Because actually your whole environment, your whole community is unsafe. Um, does that make sense? I mean, they're like, um, for me, um, working with a lot of women from East, from, uh, East Europe, you know, from the East Bloc, they might come from a village where actually everybody was implicit and involved in what happened to them, um, either through abusing them throughout their youth, or you know making arrangements with traffickers, or um, exploiting them in different ways. So sometimes people's whole community, um, the people around them, the sort of like uh, ecosystem that they are living in, is the thing that puts them at risk. Sorry to interrupt. Let's keep moving. So family and community systems, uh, we talked about discrimination and acceptance of abuse and exploitation. Um, I think one of the examples I've given of this before, that's an outside the US example, is that there are whole communities in places like uh, Cambodia, where um, all of the children in a particular village are sold um, as sex slaves. Um, and this is something accepted by the community. This is something accepted by parents. That actually none of the adults in the village work, but they actually just um, use their children 
currency. And uh, it's heartbreaking that that's an example of a whole system uh, in which this kind of use and exploitation. And of course, that can happen on a smaller scale with families. Uh, that's something to really be aware of as well when we're in the healthcare field is that um, there are families that will cover up and, uh, and continue to protect in a closed environment in which vulnerable people, usually children, can be exploited. Um, literacy and language is a huge risk factor for vulnerability. If you can't um, understand uh, your, your legal rights written down, you don't know what you might be signing or what you might be agreeing to. If you can't access really services that are available to you as a vulnerable, you know, person in the vulnerable people group because you simply can't read them or you can't understand them. Um, that's a huge factor for vulnerability. And a lot of times um, we may not be aware that the people that we're working with either don't fully understand what we're saying, we're explaining to them things about our health and wellness, or, uh, or that they might not be able to educate themselves further in the ways that we take for granted. This is just a little statistic. 774 million adults, it's 15 and older, still cannot read or write, and two-thirds of those are women. This is a global statistic. Um, cultural practices. Um, more and more, probably in your context there, you will see people from um, different cultural backgrounds. There are a lot of cultural practices people at risk. Um, some of them is just uh, some of them are simply a mindset about their hood. So someone who has been exploited or uh, has other risk factors might be seen as the, by the community as bad luck or a bad person just because bad things have happened to them. Um, that's something that we see often in our context here. That women can't return to their communities because the community has decided that even though they didn't do anything wrong, there must be something bad about them and that why these things happen to them. Um, and that can happen in family systems as well, right? That somehow the victim is made to feel that uh, what happened to them is their fault, um, that they must have been asking for it, you know, you could say. And that's something we hear a lot working with people who are at risk for abuse or XP. Um, female genital mutilation, not a fun thing to talk about, but still a very culturally accepted practice around the world, um, and you can read more about that, but that's something that puts women at risk right from the get-go. We don't have time to go into all that, but that's a cultural practice. It's putting women's um, lives and their futures at risk for exploitation all the time around the world. Uh, voodoo, so this has to do with um, uh, spiritual practices that may be oppressive or that um, uh, it's a way of kind of keeping people vulnerable on a spiritual level. So it has to do with manipulation, it has to do with um, kind of a, a ritual and threats and, and a using of spirituality to threat people. Um, these are just all things that, that you might not have thought about. So how can people in the healthcare field impact that vulnerability state? Um, the most important thing that you guys can do is to recognize vulnerability. You know, don't assume that everybody has choice. Don't assume that everybody understands their rights. Don't assume that everybody uh, is safe. Um, so really, uh, those are skills that you have to build, but knowing those factors and knowing what's, what to look for can really help. Um, I'm not sure, I can maybe send this link to some of your professors, but there was a great um, little awareness orientation done by um, uh, Mainline Health Systems about human trafficking to help healthcare providers recognize victims of abuse and trafficking. It's just a simple like little quiz that you give yourself to see would I be able to recognize, um, you know, based on people's charts, based on my interviews with people, based on those interactions, would I be able to recognize some of the red flags, some of the risk factors for vulnerability? Um, empower people at risk. This is a, this is a huge thing that you can do. People that are on this vulnerability scale and maybe close to being exploited by others. 
Um, empower them by giving them um, information, by let, allowing them to be educated about their own rights, about their own value, um, treat them with dignity and respect. A lot of times victims or people from traumatized groups or vulnerable people groups feel that, um, that they're sort of labeled with this label of victim. And so we can unconsciously we keep people in, in that place of vulnerability by not allowing them to move past that and recognize their accomplishment and their courage and uh, the people that they are true. Uh, and there's lots of little ways that we can do that without even trying. I can't go into all of that, but you know, look for ways um, to empower people who are vulnerable. Uh, not to make decisions for them and not or try to save them in every situation, but to try to build them up so that they can um, stand on their own two feet. Uh, help build communities. And uh, one of the really hard things for one is that uh, a lot of times they exist in one of these systems that's very dangerous and that actually keeps them vulnerable. Um, we need new communities for those people. So a lot of times it's very scary for that person to leave that community because it's all they know. Um, and so healthcare context can partner with other services, with NGOs, um, with faith-based organizations in order to build a whole community around vulnerable people so that they have safe people to turn to and they have the resources that they need to move on that scale towards safety and stability. Um, contribute to victim resiliency. And this just has a lot to do with uh, just the little ways in which we acknowledge what people have been through um, and uh, and respect them for it. This has a lot to do with letting people have ownership of their stories and telling their stories the way that they want, to who they want, when they want to. Um, a lot of this just has to do with uh, the, the respect that we need to have for those who are vulnerable and for those who might have experienced exploitation. So, yeah, that's what I had to share with you guys. And um, I want to take time for questions. I know you may have time for uh, questions about the context here. Um, so I'll give you a couple more details about that. Um, I work at two, uh, for one NGO that has two sites here for refugees. One is a a program for refugee moms and kids. It's an integration program. Um, and the other one is a dormitory for unaccompanied minor refugee boys. So that's boys under the age of 16 who were left in Athens without their parents. Um, so I serve at both of those facilities. The other NGO um, where I'm serving is one that reaches out to uh, victims of human trafficking and prostitution. We have about um, 4 million human trafficking victims just in the European Union, and most of those are um, being trafficked for sexual exploitation. So it's a huge problem in Athens um, for the same reasons as the refugee crisis. It was so bad here because Greece has over a thousand islands. So its borders are really porous, and it's very hard to control the traffic coming in and out. And that's also why it's an ideal spot for trafficking, because we really can't monitor or police all the points of entry. So that means traffickers can use it as a place to bring, uh, to traffic persons back and forth. Um, and the majority of that is for ex uh, sexual exploitation. So what are the questions that you guys have about vulnerable people groups, about traumatized people groups, maybe about just what's happening in Europe or, yes. Um, the study that you mentioned in the beginning about how I think it was like 74% of sex workers or something are seen by healthcare providers, did it say what they're seen for specifically? Um, no, a lot of it. Um, I'm making that space in my. Oh, okay. 
Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, the statistic that I mentioned was that 74% of human trafficking victims see a health care provider in the first few weeks of their being trafficked. Um, they're seeing all kinds of in uh, injuries, um, and a lot of that has to do with the process of human trafficking. I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt you again. It's just cutting in and out, so I'm not sure if there's a problem with your mic or, but we're having trouble understanding you. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm sure I can do much about that. Um, can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay. Um, I was just saying that the statistic that I shared was that 74% of human trafficking victims see some kind of health care provider in the first two weeks of being trafficked. Could you understand that? Could you guys hear that? Okay. Um, now, we know that there are a variety of injuries that happen in that critical first period when someone's been trafficked. Um, because often there are escape attempts. Um, often, uh, we know that um, in human trafficking, there's a period of, of what they, what people in the field call seasoning. Sorry, this is a little disturbing, but it's a time where usually a victim is kept uh, locked up and maybe raped repeatedly or beaten. And it's basically a, a, a time where they're trying to break the person's will. And um, it, it includes a lot of just sort of psychological, um, conditioning and breaking of the person so that they don't resist anymore. And so inherent in that is that you get a lot of a lot of injuries that may have to be treated. So the kind of things you guys might see is a young girl coming in with an older man or or any person that that is kind of refusing to leave her or let her speak for herself and maybe she has an injury that can't really be explained. Um, easily, or she doesn't seem she seems afraid, or seems like she's willing to talk to you. Again, there's more um, resources for that online about how you, as a healthcare provider, can flag for that type of thing. And then uh, um, there are procedures for you guys too. And I'll try to send the, the particular um, survey that I was talking about uh, to um, to your professor and have have her send it out to you guys. But um, it, it has just a bunch of red flags that you can look for in those contexts. So it would be all different injuries related to their, their them being trafficked. Thank you. Sure. You mentioned that gender was uh, a risk factor. What percentage do you see of men or transgender individuals? Uh, yeah, uh, we do have um, that factor for sure um, in Greece. So we work with um, transgender uh, individuals in prostitution. We're also having a, a large problem right now in Athens with underage unaccompanied minor refugee boys, such as the ones in the home um, that I work with, being sexually exploited. So they're, they're at a huge risk. Um, they're on their own, they don't have a family, they don't have a community, uh, and what we see happening, for instance, in the park, right next to the home and the day program that we run, is that traffickers will convince boys that uh, that they can earn enough money prostituting themselves in order to travel to Germany and re be reunited with their families. And these young boys, not understanding uh, language, not understanding the environment that they're in, not understanding the currency, are being prostituted in this park for 50 cents a client, thinking, if I just save a little more, if I just do this a little longer, I'll be reunited with my family. So um, yeah, so there's no, there are risk factors across the board for everybody, and of course, in their 
in your instance, you know, being displaced, not having documentation, or not having a family system, all of those kind of things are risk factors for them. Um, so it's not that gender is exclusively a risk factor, it's that sometimes we don't recognize that just gender alone can, can in different contexts, be a risk factor. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you for speaking to the students. Um, how, do, how are you and your colleagues debriefed, and how do you deal with the psychological impact of this work on a daily basis? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so that is the rule that I'm talking about. Did you do something? I can't hear you. Um, okay, so I was just saying that um, that is actually my role at the two refugee sites, is to do staff care and debrief. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yeah, so um, what we do in our context is we have regular weekly group debriefing, where we talk about not just the cases and the things that have happened, but we process together our emotions related to those events, how they made us feel. Um, and if you're gonna work with people in vulnerability and you're gonna work with traumatized populations, you have to be very aware of uh, what we call secondary or vicarious trauma. It is a very real thing. Um, and so I would really encourage you if you're gonna serve a population like that in a healthcare context, be really educated about self-care. Be really educated about secondary trauma, how the trauma of somebody else or even of a, a people group that you're trying to serve might affect you personally. And you have to be really vigilant about that. So one of the things that, that I do in those refugee contexts is uh, the weekly debriefs, but I also do one-on-one -on -one counseling um, because I have a background in trauma um, and trauma recovery. I'll do one-on-ones with staff um, whenever they need it to work through and process some of those more difficult emotions. Sure, I hope that answers your question. Hi, I'm sorry. I, I would like to know how, um, see, your presentation is still abstract to me. I don't know if it's clear to everybody else, but can you give us an example as to how we would handle a patient that we think is being trafficked. Okay, that's a good question. I'm not you um, really clear details on that is because I don't um, serve in the U.S. and I don't serve in your state, um, so that's not my context. So. What I would really encourage you guys to do, and I can talk with your professors about this, um, is to be educated yourself about what, you know, what are you supposed to do in the state of Pennsylvania as a healthcare provider if you think you're treating a victim of human trafficking. There is actually a protocol for that. Um, uh, when I was in the states last year, I helped on an advisory board that developed a protocol for mainline health systems, um, which is a is a health network in your area, and you may have heard of it before. Um, so I can send some of those links along, uh, but because that's not my context, that's why I'm not giving you those details, because I wanna make sure that you know from the state of Pennsylvania and the context that you're in, what is the protocol that you are supposed to follow. So these are more just giving you an idea of what are those red flags that you're looking for. What is it that makes a person at risk for exploitation? When you can identify, okay, this person has four or five of those risk factors that we talked about. Um, so maybe I need to dig a little deeper. Maybe I need to ask a few more questions. Maybe I need to speak to a supervisor. You know, that, those are the kind of, that's what I'm trying to give you an, an overall picture of vulnerable people groups and how to recognize them. Does that answer your question or does that help a little bit? Yes, it was very helpful. Thank you. Sure, sure. 
Anything else? cultural factors for sure here. Um, one of the things that impacts our, our work with victims of human trafficking is that one in every four Greek men pays for sex on a regular basis. So it's not just a tourist um, situation, but it's also there's, there's, like, there's low population that's enabling this exploitation to continue. Um, so that's a big thing for us. It it's, used to be an accepted part of the culture that when a boy turned 14, you would take him to a brothel to have his first experience. And this is the macho culture. Then that boy would always have more experience sexually than, and, than his, the next nurse that he had. And it was just um, an accepted part of uh, Greek life and family structure and everything. So it was your dad that would take you and this is just a normal acceptance. So we see that thing, factors like that have really contributed to expectation. Um, there's a real breakdown of, lo of law enforcement on a local level. So for instance, even we have a policy of non-cooperation with local police. So that means I'm not going to give can you just repeat that last? It was a little broke up a little bit. Sure. Um, saying that this corruption, in my context, local level, um, we walk with a work. Um, we don't answer questions. Uh, I'm sorry. No. We're really having trouble hearing you. That, um, um, and I'm also going to warn you, and I'm sorry, but. Um, we might run out of power for you pretty soon. So we're going to try. If anybody has a Dell cable, I, I did not bring one, unfortunately, because I thought I had one here. So if anybody has a Dell cable that I could try, um, we'll try one. Um, the great one here is right there. Can you guys? Okay. Yeah. just think about your context and see if there are any similarities. But, um, I'll continue to tell you a couple other factors here. So what I was saying was that we do not cooperate um, with local law enforcement. So our NGO that serves victims of human trafficking and prostitution, we actually have a non-cooperation policy. And the reason for that is because local law enforcement are implicit and involved in the trafficking of persons. Um, it's it's all with organized crime, but local people on local level, local officials and law enforcement are being paid to look the other way. They're being paid to say that brothels are legal and have met um, the requirements when they haven't. So uh, we don't give any information to the local police. We don't um, we don't call them for help. We have a very good relationship with Ministry of Human Trafficking here in Athens, uh, but but we're very aware that on the local level, there's too much corruption for us to be able to cooperate and work with them. Um, and there are organizations that are trying to address that through educating uh, on the local level and reminding people of the law and uh, their rights, but that's a difficult thing that we uh, Battle here. Is that is that what you were looking for? Yeah, and that was great. Um, and can you just briefly, maybe? Um, well, first, does anybody have any other questions? Okay. So just the last thing, if you could, is talk about the employment and training that you offer that you help plug women into who are desirous of leaving. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that came out of 
the NGO serving people affected by human trafficking and exploitation uh, is an employment opportunity program. And that is really just creating opportunity uh, for women. It's, it's really for women who are fleeing sexual exploitation. So um, in that context, we provide job training. So we teach women, we give women six weeks of free um, sewing lessons. Uh, we have a therapeutic element to that as well. And after those six weeks, um, if they're at a point where they're, they want to make a clean break this type of lifestyle or they can be um, assisted into getting to a shelter or a safe and stable living situation, then we can employ them. So right now we have, um, for instance, seven women employed and another five or six in training. So um, yeah, there, there's a lot of pieces to, to um, that stability and that safety that we talked about on the end of that scale, there's about a thousand steps in there, right? Between exploitation and getting off the way to safety and stability. So um, that's one thing that I think is really important for healthcare providers is that we network together and that we find other organizations, other providers, other NGOs, faith-based communities, whatever we can, if we're well networked so that these people can have all the steps that they need to move and that they don't get stuck somewhere because we can only provide them with this. Um, so yeah, I think that's really important. Uh, the name of that um, organization is called Threads of Hope. Um, you can visit it at threadsofhope.gr. Uh, and those product, products that those women um, are, sell, are sold throughout the U.S. You can buy them online. Can look at them there. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks very much for being with us.